anyone? The Lord's been impressing something on your spirit. Okay. Praise the Lord. God is good. Good to be in God's house. We on we on yet, brother? Yeah. Welcome to those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Maybe give me just a little less volume on my mic. I can get loud a little bit. Um, chapter four. What we're going to be studying tonight is the uh, brief history of hermeneutics. We're not going to get into detail because there's too much detail to get into. And it's a lot of history and, the, and a lot of those things. So we're not going to get into that. We're going to just touch the basics of it just to get a general idea. Um, does anyone know who were the first person to that we know of that used hermeneutics? Anybody know who that was in the Bible? Also Paul? Yeah, he was in the New Testament, yes. Everyone's looking at their notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's there. Yeah. Well, Ezra is the one that was first there to use um, hermeneutics. And you find that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah when the law was being brought back, and he taught the people what the Word of God said. Uh, he used principles, of course, and remember that it's not just something that's intuitive or something that's subjective, but it's something that is objective. And a lot of times what happens in history is that you'll see that through the different periods of history, they've gone from the grammatical historical interpretation to a more mystical type and then from there to a rationalistic type, and then back to a mystical type. It depends on the, on the generation that, uh, of time that we're talking about. But Ezra was the father of hermeneutics. And if you, um, you look in uh, Nehemiah 8, verses 1 to 8, we can look at that scripture if you put that up on the board this, tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, you're going to help us, Lord, to understand how to interpret your word. It's it's important that we have Bible study and know what the Bible says, but we've got to know how to be able to interpret it correctly so that we don't go off in different directions and we don't have your authority behind what we think your word says. We have your authority behind what your word does say. And so, Father, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It says that the, uh, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Here you see, uh, we're going to go right through to verse 8 in a moment, but the people here, they, they asked for it. Go back again to verse 1, please, for a moment. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man, into the street that was before the water gate. And it's amazing, you know, I, I don't think things are done coincidentally, that it was near the water gate that they, they, they wanted to hear the word of God. You know, and we talk about how the Apostle Paul says, by the washing of the water of the word. And uh, it's just, uh, when you start doing comparisons like that, it just start, brings out a little bit more truth there. It says, and they spake unto, the, unto Ezra the scribe, or the one who was the interpreter, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. The people wanted it. It's kind of different today where people really don't want it. <laughs> they want to go to church and be entertained. They want to go to church and you know, feel good and fuzzy and all that kind of stuff. But they don't want the Word of God because if they have the Word of God, it's going to bring them to a place of decision. 
Always remember that. The Word of God will bring you to a place of decision. You know, like Joshua says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But God's Word is there for a reason, and it's there to teach us and to uh, mold us and to shape us and to get us to a place where we abandon self and our philosophies and ideologies of what we think versus what God's Word says. And um, so Ezra uh, was, was ready to do it, and here the people are crying out. You know, sometimes we, we, we have to wait for society to get to that point. And God does things in different ways. And I've been watching all over, all over the world what's going on with the fires and the West Coast and the floods and the, now the earthquakes. And I'm, I'm telling you, I counted like, I don't know, over 40 earthquakes in one day all over the world. And it was like, wow. And some of them were like 4, 4.7, 5, you know, 3. If, if they're less than 5, usually they don't get reported. But, I mean, there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of earthquakes that have happened in one month all over the world. And, you know, Jesus said that there were going to be diverse earth, there's going to be earthquakes in diverse places and all different places. And uh, I believe that simultaneously. It's not just like one here, one day, and then the next day it's going to be over there. But diverse in, in, in many places, meaning all at the same time. And these are happening all at the same time. It's amazing. So here, as, here they're crying out to Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Now, there's two ways to handle the word of God. There's one way is to handle it in an intellectual way. We talked about the different ways last week. We talked about how there's the rationale, how uh, that, that, that uh, in particular um, way of interpreting the Bible through ration is to actually deny the authority of the scriptures because we're relying upon the authority of our minds to uh, rationale and say, well, if that doesn't come up with what's, what seems to be uh, rational, then that can't be true. And so we end up nullifying the very truth of God. Like when someone reads that Peter walked on water, you know, rationale will tell you, okay, we have the law of physics and we have the law of gravity and we have that is an impossibility. That cannot happen. So they take the supernatural ability out of it and they rationalize it and say, so that therefore can't be true. It can't be true that Jonah was in a whale and survived. That, that can't happen. It doesn't make sense. So the rationale becomes the final authority and not God's word. But Ezra here, now the people are calling out and saying, we want the word of God. And I know that God's word says, and Jesus said these words, he said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But the hunger and the thirsting has to come. People say, well, you know, when God wants me to read my Bible, he moves me to read my Bible. I say, no. I say, you've got to pick it up. You've got to desire it first. It has to be in your heart first. You have to want to read the Word of God. Uh, because you can just read the Word of God just for uh, simple uh, feelings of that I have to. You know, I, it's just part of what I've got to do. And, and if that's the thinking you have when you go to God's Word, that I'm just gonna ha I have to read it because my wife or my husband or my sister or my brother told me that I had to or my pastor, you're not going to get anything out of it. You've got to desire it. You've got to want it. And so here the people were wanting it, and uh, they were saying, hey, we want, we want the word of God which the Lord had commanded Israel through Moses. We want to hear what God has to say. Now, th remember, this is a time where they came out of captivity from Babylon. So they were in Babylon for 70 years. And we don't really know, you know or understand how much of, of the Lord's word uh, that they were obeying in that. I mean, it's kind of hard for people to obey God in bondage. You know, I don't know how, how, how much freedom they had. I do know that there were some synagogues that were erected, but we don't know what type of uh, interpretation was being used or who was doing what. But now here the people are coming, saying they're coming out of captivity. They're saying, okay, now we want the word of God. Amen. And doesn't that happen when you're born again? I mean, when you're truly born again, you're in, before you're born again, you're in captivity to sin. You're in captivity to the old nature. And then when you become a Christian, I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, all of a sudden, the birds started chirping, the grass looked greener, you know, everything looked different. Everything seemed different. Did that, am I only one that happened to? Was I hallucinating or did that happen to a lot of you too? It just, everything looked different. It, it sounded different. I was paying attention to things that I never paid attention to before. It's like God opened up 
and brought back to life my spirit that was dead, separated from him. And so um, here these people are now desiring, they want the word of God. And verse 2 says this. Verse 2 says, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the month of the seventh month. Verse 3, please. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Boy, you talk about our long services. Okay? From morning until midday. So you're looking at what? From 7 in the morning probably to 12? Is that 5 hours? Just reading. Wow. Wow. Well, pastor, the service is two hours. That's too long. My Lord, you, 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 don't, you have to preach so long? <laughs> but don't forget, two hours, that's the whole service. That's the, the prayer time. That's the, uh, the worship time, the praise time. And then that's the, the offering time. And then the testimony time. And then the preaching of the word. So you get all of that. This was just the word of God being read. Okay, and it says, from the morning to midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. They were attentive. They weren't falling asleep. They weren't yawning. They weren't bored. Why? Why do you think that was? Yeah, they had a hunger for God. They really did. I mean, you think about this. You know, <clears throat> you've been exiled from your country and from your, your, your roots, and you've been exiled from worshiping God and been exiled from, you know, like Jerusalem, the capital city. You know, you've been, you've been exiled from the protection of those walls that God provided, and now you were in the hands of the enemy. You come out of that now, and what do you want to do? You want to go back to what you had. They wanted, they wanted God. They, they, they wanted to, to be with God. And so, um, verse 4, please. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. Now you wonder where that all came from. He stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood uh, Mattathiah, what is that, Mattathiah? And Shema, and Ananiah, and Urijah. Hilkiah and Messiah on his right hand and on his left. Padiah and Michelle and Mal I can't see that. Malchiah. Malshia and Hashem and Hashpadana, Zechariah and Meshulam. Next verse. I hope there's no more. Okay. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. That's where it all came from. And it was above that so everyone could see and everyone could hear. It wasn't because they were better. It was because they could hear and see. And it says, and when he opened it, all the people did what? What's missing today? Respect. Respect for the Word of God. We've got, we've got people that are going into ministry today that don't know how to interpret the Bible. We've got people today, and, and I never forgot this. <clears throat> I was with somebody, and uh, I forget where I was, but I was with somebody, and, and it was a guy from, uh, from Zion. And he was going to graduate. And they asked him, you know, what's the one thing you're looking for in ministry? And he said, uh, Money and babes. Money and babes. Yeah. Money and babes. Yeah. He wanted to get a, a wife, you know, and he wanted to make money. And I almost turned around and said, you know what? Why don't you go be a car salesman? Do something else. Because um, that's not the motive of why somebody goes into ministry. Although that's the kind of things that are going on today. And that's why the church is in a lot of condition it's in. Because in some of these, in some of these interpretation methods that we're going to be talking about, 
um, some of them actually end up undermining the very theology of God's Word. They take away from it, and they water it down and water it down and water it down, and that's why you get some of the, uh, I call them perversions today. They're not real versions. They're perversions of the Word of God. If you look and you see some in some of the translations and some of the Bibles that are coming out, and this is a known fact, that if you want to, if you're, if you're a, say you're an organization that you want to produce the Bible and you want to keep all the royalties, in order to do that and escape uh, any kind of um, sharing the royalties with someone else, you have to change 100,000 words. So think about that. Change 100,000 words. So you start changing words, okay, and someone once said to me, well, it's only a matter of semantics. I say, no, because all you have to do is change one word or add one word or subtract one word, and it changes the content of that dramatically. Well, before we go on, let me give you an example so you don't understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a NIV fan, never have been, never will be. Because of, uh, they say, oh, well, the newer manuscripts don't have this, or the older manuscripts don't have that. I don't care. In Ephesians, I think it is, chapter, I'm going to say chapter 2 or chapter 4. I'm not, it says, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't really know the full gist of it off the top of my head. But it says, uh, Paul was saying to the Ephesians, God who is, in, uh, who, is, who is all and in you all, in the King James. In the NIV, it says, God who is all and in all. Well, God's not in all. But you take that word you out, and it changes the entire context of what Paul was saying. Paul was talking to Ephesian, the Ephesian church, the Ephesian believers, and he's saying God who is all and in you all, meaning specifically to the Ephesian believers. But the newer versions are taking that word you out, and so somebody reads and say God who is all and in all. So a Buddhist can open up the Bible and say, see, God's in me. Okay? A Muslim can come and say, see, God's in me. Your own Bible says it. By changing one word. Jehovah's Witnesses did that. And the word was, a God. <laughs> Just one. Just one. And so... You have to be careful. And, and, and that's why I, I'm, very, I'm a King James person. I'll take other versions and I'll compare it. When I go back to, when, to the nitty-gritty, it's King James Bible. That's what I like. Okay, and then that's what I use. Um, you can use whatever you want to, but uh, if, you look, if you look, you'll find Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scriptures taken out about the blood of Jesus, Jesus being the Christ, so many things of Scriptures that have been uh, taken out of there. Uh, I think it is, uh, uh, one of them is um, in the Lord's Prayer. I think it's one that says, Our Father which art in heaven, King James. Other versions, Our Father. Period. So you've got to be careful. <clears throat> okay. So Ezra, let's continue going on. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people when he opened, all the, opened it, all the people stood up. In verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen. With lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, if we want to know what true protocol and true worship is, and um, I'm trying to remember um, the title of the book. Remember that book I've got for you? Did I give you that book? Uh, it was a book by um, Jeremiah Burroughs. Yeah, Gospel Worship. It was written, I think, in the 18th century, 18-something or 16-something. I forget when, the, when it was. But he goes on to, to describe what real pure worship is. And I'll tell you, we are so far from it. It's unbelievable. They're so far from it. Look, look at their posture. Look at how they approached God, right? Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with how did they do that? How did they answer? 
with lifting up their hands. You got people in church today sitting like this, sitting down during worship, looking all around, biting their nails, looking at their nails, doing all kinds of stuff, looking to see who's coming in, who's going out, and it's like they're not worshiping God. You know, they, they, what's missing is the respect of the sanctuary. What's missing is the reverence of God being awesome in who He is because we've taken Him down and brought Him to our level of thinking. And He's not like us. <laughs> he really isn't. Okay? He's far greater, superior, awesome, powerful uh, in His greatness and His immensity and in His glory. Hallelujah. And when you begin to speak those things, you can sense the presence of God. But when you don't have the reverence for him and the reverence to him, then you have just fluff. Here the people when they when they when he was saying these things and blessed the Lord, it says they lifted up their hands and they bowed their heads. They weren't looking up like this when they worship. Why? Because they were looking down like this because they're not worthy to enter his presence. They're not. You know, it, I mean, all the times I read in the Bible where, where Jesus appeared to people, you know, he wasn't sitting on their bed with their, his arm around them talking to them like a buddy. Like some of these people on TV say they went up to heaven and they talked to Jesus and he put his arm around them. And, no. I mean, when Isaiah saw, saw the Lord high and lifted up, what did he do? What was the first thing he did? He fell on his face. And what was the second thing he did? He said to God, right? He says he covered his head, right? And he said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. That's what God's presence does. It reveals. See, and, and when, when he was revealing the word of God to them, they bowed their heads, they lifted their hands, they bowed their heads, and it says, and they, they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Why would they do in that? Why? Given reference to God, but why did they have their faces bowed to the ground? Because that's where they came from. From dust they came. They're just dirt. That's like what my grandmother said, we're just a bucket of dirt. That's all we are, just a bucket of dirt. Okay. And that was... That was the reverence. That was, and I believe that in the atmosphere, God brings illumination to his word. I believe God brings a revelation, not a new revelation, but a revelation or illumination, whatever way you want to look at it, to his word. I mean, that's why sometimes you read something and you can go over it for a thousand times. You don't see it. One day you're just worshiping the Lord and praising the Lord and the spirit of God falls in that place where you're at. And you just fall on your face before God and you're just worshiping him. And God speaks a, spe a scripture to you. The other day, God spoke a scripture to me in Philippians. And I texted it to everybody. It wasn't because I just felt like it. But I was just enjoying the presence of the Lord. And, and all of a sudden, the, the Lord put that scripture in my, my heart. And I just wrote it out and what I said. And I just, and I just felt sent it to everybody, to encourage everybody. And so I sent it out. Amen. I, that, you know... Some of the greatest sermons that are preached, and you have to study, you have to, you have to spend time with God. You have, to, you have to, you know, keep your time. But some of the best messages were when God just inspired it. Now, see, like God inspired my message for Sunday already, so now I'm going to start going into it and looking at it a little bit, finding out what is the avenues, what's the direction you want to go, what is the particular things you want to bring out and, and say. And... Um, and now I'll stop putting that together. Uh, I, I really don't like just getting behind the pulpit and saying, okay. <laughs> but sometimes God has done that too. And it's like, I'm trusting you, Holy Spirit, to lead and guide me. But you know, when you've been in the Lord for a long time and you, you've heard messages and you have, there's a lot in you. He can only use what's in you. And so here they were, they were worshiping God with their faces to the ground. Verse 7. And Joshua and Bani, oh, here we go again. Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Sabbathai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kaleida, Ahaziah, 
Jehoshaphat, Hanan, if I don't pronounce these, please forgive me. Beliah and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. They caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. That's hermeneutics. It's teaching people what God's word says. Not what we think. Not our, not our interpretation. Not from our school where we went to. Because no matter what school you go to, you're going to lean to their theology. Whether you go to a Pentecostal school, or you go to Dallas Theological Sem Seminary, or you go to Wheaton, or you go to any other of these colleges and seminaries, whatever they teach, you have a tendency to go toward that direction. Some, some you know, you go to one school, you, as a Pentecostal, you come out as a Baptist. <laughs> okay. We have a student like that. Okay. Baptized in the Holy Spirit now, don't believe, don't believe she has the baptism in the Holy Spirit anymore. <clears throat> All because she went to a, a Baptist school, university. And they throw the doubts and, and Scripture out of context and all of these things. And I love, I love to sit down with Baptists. I love to sit down with them and go over the Scriptures that they use to say that the gifts have stopped in the church and it's no longer in existence. Not all of them. Thank God there are some Baptists. That are, I guess they call them progressive Baptists. Is that what they call them? Bapticostals, you know, uh, following of John the Baptist with the with a costal at the end, uh, wh whatever it is. But uh, and thank God for that that they're open. And, and uh, but there's a lot of them that are closed, and, and they just say that that's that ended in the in the church age. And and I challenge them very very much with the Word of God. And say you need to explain this to me. It's, a, it's the same. It's the same with um. Now, I'm not going to get off on my pet peeve tonight, but, you know, uh, women pastors and all that stuff. Uh, you show me, I've studied this for years and years and years. I went to Dallas Theological Seminary and I audited their textbooks on both subjects of those that were for it and those that were against it. And I studied that and studied that for two and a half years because I wanted to know in, my, in and of myself. And I came to the conclusion that every single one of them that were for it took Scripture out of context. So uh, I'm still waiting for someone to sit down with me and prove to me from the scriptures that Jesus did it, the apostles did it, and give me a scripture, give me direction, because I believe that this is the authoritation of the word. This word is authoritative to all doctrine. So if you're going to tell me that somebody believes something, you better back it up with scripture. And it better be in context. And I still haven't gotten that argument yet. Well, you know, you just have to know. I'm not going to let culture dictate to me We'll talk about that in hermeneutics also. Your culture does not dictate to you truth. In fact, Jesus even told the, um, the Jewish um, believers, he says, you make the word, of no, uh, the word of God of none effect through your tradition because their tradition and their interpretation of, of the law became so higher that they put more authority, that's called rationalistic, rationalistic interpretation, where their ration became the authority versus the word of God becoming the authority. And so what happened was they, they got so out of it that they, they made the word of God an effect by their tradition. When I was in India, there was a woman who was, who her husband, she became a Christian, her husband was a Muslim. And when she became a Christian, he, uh, he couldn't take it, and so he went out and hung himself, killed himself. He had, she had two kids, I think two or three kids. And in, in India, even in the Christian realm, okay, she was considered unclean. Nobody would marry her. And I said, I said, brothers, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, what you're doing to this poor woman, suffer, and she's suffering like this, and you're putting these, these pressures on her that she has to be a widow for the rest of her life because no one will love her, no one will take care of her. I said, that's wrong. Your traditions make the word of God not effective. The Bible says if one has a, has a spouse and they go to be with the Lord, she may become, or, you know, if something happens, she can go with another person who's only in the Lord. You know that scripture that's in there? I think it's in Corinthians. She may go and be another man's wife only in the Lord. So I said, the word of God permits it. You don't permit it. What do we have to throw out? Tradition. Amen. So we don't get all caught up in that. Because then what happens is our traditions become the authoritation, and not the word of God. So we have Ezra as, the, as here. We got one more scripture, right? Verse 8. So they read in the book of, in the law of God distinctly. 
and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That's the whole purpose of us preaching. It's not so that we can get emotional, although that's great. You know, when we get Brother Diamond here and he gets emotional and he's preaching, you know, and, you know, people are speaking in tongues and whatever. That's great. We love that. We love that kind of preaching. But the main objective of coming to church is to hear the Word of God. It's to understand the Word of God. To know what the Bible actually is saying. And when we come to church and we just get in more, I, I, I mean, I've been in church services, <clears throat> and I think it's okay 2% of the time. Somebody come to church and the you know, Spirit of God will move and stuff like that. And say, okay, well, we're not going to be preaching today. The Holy Ghost is moving. We're not going to preach today. I say, hmm. Holy Ghost is moving apart from the Word. Uh, sometimes, okay, I, I give that to God, but God says, well, why did you all gather together in the first place? Okay. Uh, yeah, we can see God move sovereignly. Yeah, he can have a sovereign, we can all come to the altar, we can be weeping, we can be crying, but go before you go home, open the word. Don't substitute the move of God for the word. God moves, you know, like we, we, we just stood there, if you when we were done with worship, I didn't come right up here. We just stood there. I said, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? I just sense your presence here. Is there anything you want to do? And I waited and I said, does anybody have anything to say? I don't have to be the only one. And of course, nobody moved, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll move on. But that's what we need to do. But if I just said, okay, well, that's it. Let's go home. <laughs> we're all done. No. You've got to open the Word. You know, and the, and the ones that are hungry are here tonight. And there's a lot of people missing tonight. And I mean, some have excuses, don't get me wrong. There's some that have legitimate excuses why they can't be here. And that's okay. But some don't. And it's like, well, I'm tired. Well, okay. Well, if you're tired, that's different. If you're going through physical problems, that's different. But if there's no excuse... All you want to do is sit home and watch the Red Sox tonight. Okay. Well, Tom Brady, maybe, you know. No. <laughs> okay. No, we don't want to do that. I mean, you know, I try to finish our services at least by 1230 on Sunday morning. So, <laughs> But if the Spirit of God moved, if he really did move, and if he really did prompt us, we'd stay. Because I'm not tied to a football game. You know, but um, that is one of my favorite pastimes. So we have what's called the Jewish hermeneutics. It's the time of period of about 457 to 19 to the present time, really, uh, where we, the father of hermeneutics was Ezra. And he, he, and he, he sh it shows us from the word that God's heart is always to expound the word, what the word is saying. You know, and, and in order to do that, there's, there's just different things that we need, to, we need to take in consideration. We need to take consideration the culture, the historical setting, we need to take uh, the language, the linguistic. We've got to we've got to understand that sometimes words in English don't truly convey what the intended the author intended to say. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? We can't trust the word. Yeah, we can trust the word, but remember that throughout history, at different times, one word would mean one thing, and it could mean a so totally different thing down the road. When I was growing up. Okay, being gay meant something totally different than what it means today. When I was a kid, being gay meant you were happy. Oh, look at him, he's a gay child. Look at him, he's a very happy child. Okay, now we laugh at that, right? But because today it has a diff whole different meaning, <laughs> okay? But at one time it meant something different. Just like in 1 Peter it says, Wives, be, su uh, be subjected to your own husbands, that by your chaste conversation you may win your... Husband, you know, to your, you know, to your chase conversation. Well, in our thinking, conversation is, I'm going to just keep talking to my husband. I'm going to keep talking to him about the Bible. I'm going to buy my chase conversation. You know, my, my, I'm going to just keep talking to him. Well, no, that's not what it means. 
Okay, Conver yeah, the conversation there is not talking and dialogue. The conversation is your lifestyle. So King James English Bible uh, interpretation of that word conversation is your lifestyle. It's not what you say. It's how you live. So you, so you see the difference? So that's, that's something else that we have to look at. Um, there was also a Palestinian Jews that were uh, the founder of the, uh, the Palestinian uh, literalist, uh, literalist School of Interpretation, where they interpreted Scripture literally. And uh, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of uh, the Bible being interpreted literally, unless it's, there's um, uh, different ways of looking at uh, the allegorical way, or maybe um, in a typology, or maybe um, a simile, or something of that nature. But other than that, uh, to, to, take, uh, to, to read um, something in the Old Testament of Jeremiah or Isaiah and put the word church where it says Israel, that's, that's a misjustice. My first question to a person that does that is, is, what gives you the authority to do that? Why do you take the, the word Israel out and put the word church? And I believe that all started back with an anti-Semitic spirit. You've got to understand, there's people, and especially Satan himself, hates the Jewish people. He hates the Jewish people because it was through the, the calling of God or the chosen of, that God chose, the nation that God had chose to bring through the Messiah, which was his defeat. So he hates the Jews. And if you look, you see, um, even today, um, I'm reminded of uh, Ben Shapiro. Here's a guy with conservative values, and he's, all he's doing is going to a school and challenging some of the thoughts of the uh, liberal uh, philosophies and ideologies that are so prevalent in, in college campuses. And they're really, they're, they're really to kill him, beat him up, destroy property. Why? Call him, and this was the, this was the thing I, I was just amazed at. They called him a white supremacist. And he bowed his head down. He said, you see this little hat on my head? <laughs> he said, white supremacy hates Jews. They don't, they don't, they're not fond of Jews. <laughs> but again, we have to be careful that our culture doesn't change the word of God. Somebody asked me a question. Well, when you go to when you go to Africa, and a person has six wives, what do you tell them? I said, well, first thing I would tell them is to get with their pastor and pray and fast and find out what God wants, because I'll tell you right now, if that was if that was acceptable, then everybody'd be moving to Nigeria so they could have six wives. Now, now, Pastor Tom, this is this is not the place. To <laughs> but ju but just think about it for a moment. You know, we we love access. You know, we love ex excess. You know, we're not happy with one piece of candy. We got to have five pieces of candy. We're not happy with one pina colada. We got to have five pina coladas. Okay, you know, you know what I'm saying? We always like the extreme. And so culture itself. So what I tell them is, you go seek the Lord and you pray. Uh, what Brother Arthur Lee used to tell him is, is the last one you're married to is the one you need to, you need to stay with, and the other five or whatever you're gonna, you have to put them out, but you take care of them financially. And he was from, he was from Canada. He was a he had a sixth grade education, and him and his wife God called him to Kenya, and he, and he planted over 500 churches, and he built 12 of them by by his own hands in the mud. You never heard of him, you probably never will till you go to heaven. But he's got a great reward in heaven because he's done so much for the Kenyan people. I can tell you miracles that he was used in, how God used him. He was known throughout Kenya as the man that gave, boy, uh, gave the boy eyes. And, and I don't want to get off from this, but uh, you know, that's just something that's you know, just thought of. And let just tell you what happened was he went to a village. Oh, well, it's part of interpretation too. You know? and he was preaching about how Jesus heals how he saves and how he delivers. And he was preaching in the church. And he says, and all of a sudden, this couple got up and, and walked out. And they were, you know, in their language. <laughs> and, uh, you know, causing a ruckus and everything. And uh, so some of the people stood up and walked out. So he said, he said, Pastor, 
did I say something wrong? You ever, ever been in a place like that where you start preaching and people start leaving? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that happened to me one time. I was invited to... <laughs> I was invited to uh, at a king's banquet uh, to be the main speaker, and I went there and uh, literally had two or three tables walk, get up and walk out. Uh, they didn't like what I said about Clint and Bill at the time, and uh, how they voted. They voted their wallets and not their conscience. So three tables get up and walk out. But anyway, so anyway, he he was preaching, and and, and uh, they uh, they asked him. They said, he said, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? And he says, no, he says, uh, they want us to go to their home. He said, okay, so, so the whole church, and this is in the middle of a service. Can you imagine that? I mean, two people from the church getting up, you know, snap, and then they start walk out, and okay, pastor, they want you to go with us. So the whole church went over to his hut where he lived, and the mother went into the hut and came, came, up, and came out to the, the, the room there, and she had her 10-year-old son in her arms. And, and uh, you know, my friend, uh, Arthur Lees, he was there with the pastor, and uh, the man came over and he went, <laughs> and he said to the pastor, what did he say? He said, you said Jesus heals. My son was born without eyes, no yokes, just hollow sockets. He wants you to pray to Jesus to heal him. Now, we've got to be careful what we preach. Because God might put you to the test. And so he turned to the pastor and he just started weeping. He says, I don't have faith in this man. The pastor leaned over to him and said, well, you better do something. <laughs> you better pray. And so he began to pray. and he, It was just a simple prayer. He said, he said it wasn't, you know, O oh Lord God of heaven, great God of all creation. There was nothing like that. He said, he just simply said to God, God, and I'll paraphrase, I don't know exactly the words he said, but I'm sure it was something like this. God, give this boy eyes. And through his tears, he, he just was shaken, and he just opened his eyes. And he, this was his testimony, right, honey? We were in his office. He said, I literally saw God form the yokes in that boy's eyes. Think about that. Yeah, while that all was happening, he says people outside the hut said that there was this blue haze that came over the village. And people were falling down on their knees and repenting and getting saved. The power of God was so, was so prevalent in that place. The hand of God was so prevalent in that place. Imagine that. You know, people just falling down on their knees and getting right with God and confessing. And the witch doctor got saved. And I, it was a miracle of what was taking place. And then finally the boy had his eyes and in the, in the, in the, in the uh, you know, the pupils and everything. And he put the boy down and the boy ran over to his parents. The entire village came to Christ. So we have to know that this word is true. The authority of God is behind the word of God. And when he says to us, like he said to Peter, when Peter was in the boat and, and, the, and the winds and the waves were blowing all over the place and Jesus came walking on the water to him. Now, it's okay for Jesus to walk on the water, right? Because he's God in human form. But then Peter said, Lord, if that's you, I wonder sometimes if he even knew what he was thinking about, you know, being such a pet. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a person that was um, so eager to just, you know, go and do something. I can't think of the word. Off. No, um, there's another word. Um, impetuous. Thank you. Uh, that he would just, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come out walking on the water. I'm sure he didn't say, you know, I, I want to walk on the water, Lord. You know, no. He was like, just bid me to come. And the Lord said, come. Now look at that word. Come. God gave Peter divine authority to overcome grass. Now see, the ra rationalistic interpretation people would say, that's impossible. No, that can't happen. Just on a, somebody saying a word. 
and he was able to do that. But remember who the word was. The word was God. And he said, come. Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking on water. Oh! Those things literally happen. And some people say, well, you know, that's a type of allegorical message about walking uh, on the water, meaning that the Holy Spirit is around you and you, and you, you know, he's under and he's, you know. They come up with all these allegorical things. No. He literally walked on water. And some may not want to believe that, but I do. I take the literal interpretation of that, that he was walking on the water. Praise God. Amen. What time is it? Through Scripture, though Scripture often needs to be interpreted culturally, the interpreter must recognize that God's Word is essentially transcultural. It transcends culture. And he must avoid the danger of allowing his own culture to dictate and corrupt the interpretation of Scripture. So we have, um, just to note, we have the Jewish hermeneutics, um, but it's different divisions, and, uh, different people in history that have come up with different changes. And then we have um, the apostolic during the time of the Apostle Paul. Um, that was from the period of about 26 to 95 AD. And then we have the literal method interpretation uh, the, uh, the, the literal grammatical historical interpretation was used by the apostle. And you'll see that in the scriptures as we study that. Jesus Christ was the perfect interpreter. Let's look at John uh, 5.39. Let me get a drink real quick. John 5.39 says this. Search the commentaries. I tell people this all the time. I have, you look at my library, I've got tons and tons and tons of books. Not only at home, but here. <clears throat> commentaries are good, but they're exactly that. They're a commentary. They're somebody's comments. So whether you have the preacher's homiletical commentary or you have um, uh, the one I'm trying to think of, uh, the pulpit commentary, or you have individual, I have individual commentaries, I have series of commentaries, uh, I have logos on my, my computers with over 10,000 uh, books and, and uh, uh, volumes on that. That's all good. Okay. But If I read some of the commentaries, they tell me, well, the speaking in tongues is of the devil. If I read other commentaries, it tells me that it's not for today. Then I read some other commentaries, they say it is for today, or, or it was for today, but during the Reformation time, it stopped and it's no longer today. So you get all these people's commentary about things, but you don't, and I'm not saying that they're wrong to have a commentary. It's great to research because you get people's other people's ideas. But I go back to the scripture, and I go back to the context, and I say, this is what I want. I mean, literally, I, I heard a preacher say this one time. Uh, and I'll tell you who it was. It was Jim Baker. And it was before he fell. And uh, he put a train in um, PTL, you know, a little choo-choo train, go all around the whole park. And so people were saying, you know, you're wasting God's money. Was it say that in the Bible, you've got to put a train? And he says, oh, it's in the Bible. You know where I'm going to go with that? Isaiah. And his train filled the temple. 
So he used that scripture as a justification to put a train in PTL. I said, he's, he's all done. I said, he, he's, he's, he's in danger now. And then, of course, after that, all, all the stuff, other stuff started coming out. You can't do that. You can't change God's word to justify your, your ministry or, you know, I don't know. I, I just I shake my head and I say, how in, in God's name can anybody do that? Or say that, even I bring it up to today to Bill Johnson, saying that the, the gold dust was from God. You know, he's in service and then all of a sudden gold dust falling all over him. And, and that's God and all the people, oh, that's God and all this stuff. Well, is it? What do you think? Is it possible God could do that? Let me ask you this question. When God heals, does he heal somebody with a prosthetic or does he give him a, like that boy, did he give him a glass eyes? No, he gave him eyes. When somebody needs a new liver, do they give him a, do they give him a fake liver? No, he gives him a, so this gold dust and gold teeth and all this other stuff, why doesn't God just replace it with an enamel? Like, you know, he created teeth to be. God didn't create teeth to be gold. The devil's always tricking people, just like he tried to trick Jesus, turn these stones into bread. That's not how bread's made. Let's use another substance. Let's use your powers to do something that's not quite the way it's supposed to go, Jesus. Oh, and by the way, they did. Someone did take the samples of that gold that fell from his services to a scientist. They 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 put it under the microscope, found out it was synthetic. In other words, man-made. God used man-made gold. So that's just some of the things. So don't believe everything you see and hear of people. You know. All right, I'll give you another example. When you read the Bible, you can't do everything it says. What do you mean, Pastor? Wait a minute, what are you talking about? Okay. Elijah died, right? They buried him. Then they threw another guy that was dead, and they threw him in the grave, right? What happened to him? Hit the bones of Elijah, came to life. You know that there are preachers' wives that are going, and they call it soaking. And they're going to Catherine Kuhlman's grave, and they're literally laying down on her grave for an impartation. That's happening. Think about that. Going and, and using scripture, using scripture as an avenue to justify it. I thought the anointing didn't come from a person. I thought it came from Jesus. Didn't he say that? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he hath anointed me. The anointing doesn't come from a person. Now, the blessing can come from the person, like your grandfather laying hands on you and blessing you. Yeah, you can get the blessing. You can't get the anointing anywhere but from God. So be careful in choosing the proper methods of interpreting the Bible the way that God had intended. And we're going to talk about next week the history because it's, like, it's already quarter past three and I don't want to take up much time. But Jesus Christ is the perfect uh, interpreter. We, we talked about that. Well, let's we'll look at that for a moment. Search the scriptures. That's a good thing. But he's telling them, for in them you think you have eternal life. So they were lifting the word of God and saying, well, as long as we have the word of God, we have eternal life. No, you don't. You need to be saved. You need to have a, you need to have a sacrifice for your sins. But well, we do. We have goat, bloods and goats. Yeah, but it's already been told you that they cannot save you. Jesus Christ is Messiah. Oh, we don't believe that. that. I'm sorry, we're still waiting for the Messiah. Well, I'm sorry, you're wrong. He says, and they are they, 
Which, and they are they. What's the they there? How'd you come to know that? How do you know what they and they are mean? How did you know that? But in them, key word is them, right? But in them, and they are they. But in them, search the scriptures, but in them, which is a reference back to searching the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. And they, which refers to them, which refers to scripture. It's in context. That's what I was trying to get you to say, because I'm reading it in context. And that's, what, that's how you get the meaning of it. It says, and they are they which what? Testify of me. You, you ever see Jesus in the Old Testament? How many have ever not seen Jesus in the Old Testament reading? Raise your hand. You read the Old Testament, but you don't see Jesus in there. Is he there? Isaiah prophesied of him. Genesis prophesied of him. Exodus. There was typology. The blood on the doorposts. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Okay? So they, they testify of who he was and what was his mission and what he was going to do. So next week we'll talk about the history of uh, uh, some of the methods or principles Jesus used in his interpretation of the Old Testament. And some of those uh, principles uh, are still applicable to today for really interpreting the scriptures. You know, the Bible says, I'll close with this scripture, and Timothy says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. What a lot of people don't realize is that when you're standing there with the Bible open, be assured that there's a spirit of truth and there's a spirit of error. And that spirit of error wants to get a hold of you and kind of get you over to believe a little something, you know, like, you know, did God really mean that? Did, I mean, that's his tactic. He did it with Eve. Did, did God really mean that? Is, is that what it really means? Or, And so what happens is in some of these other interpretation methods, they begin to look for things that are hidden. You know, you've got to look for the hidden message. You know, it's really, really deep. You've got to go real deep to find out what's hidden. But they go so deep that they change the literal. Like I was telling you, exchanging the name Israel for, for the church there. They're changing the actual meaning of who the letter was written to or who it was, ad, who it was addressed to. You can't do that. I don't believe we have the permission of God to do that. But let's take the principle of that. We can do that. Yes. That's Revelation, I think. Yeah, don't add to or take away from the word of God. Yeah. So we can't. And I and I, I, I want to I just want to say that be careful because there's a lot of preachers on TV that are making things up. And I'll just give you one scripture. If you're a Pentecostal, you've probably been around this. You've probably heard this a thousand, maybe ten thousand times. Okay. Wherever two or three are gathered together in the midst, there Jesus is. Right? You heard that, right? Huh? Yes. It's about church discipline. It's not about the presence of God being with us. Because literally, Jesus is not here with us. Literally. When I say literally, what do I mean? I mean his bodily presence leaving heaven because he's and being here in our midst. Like I'm standing here. here. That's literal. He's not here. Where is he? He says, I go away, for I prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. So he's still there so that we can be with him there. Okay. And he's there 
And he said, well, well, what about when he came for the Apostle Paul? Yeah, but he never came to earth. His feet never touched terra firma. Never. He said he heard a voice from heaven, and a light shined from heaven. He came down and blinded him, knocked him down. Some people say, see, he was on a horse. Where's that? That's not scriptural. That's somebody's commentary. I, I still challenge anybody to find that he was riding on a horse or a donkey or something. In fact, the Jewish culture was, because it, it was at midday, at midday they would all face Jerusalem and pray. So most likely he was just standing there, if you go by Jewish custom and history. It's very interesting. But a lot of comments say, yeah, God knocked him off the horse. Mm, I don't think so. Okay. You can believe that if you want to. But Jesus is here now by and through the Holy Spirit. The dispensation of the church today is that God, Jesus said, I'm going away. And I'm going to send you another comforter. And he's going to speak the things that, I, that I, I've said, and he's going to bring it back to your remembrance. So the church age now has the Holy Spirit, the person, not a power, not an influence, not a subjective power, mind power, but a real person. He's going to be in the church. And he's going to lead you, guide you, and he's going to give you comfort and strength, and he's going to give you gifts. Come on, somebody. And all those things. And so when a person says, oh, Jesus, I mean, I heard this so many times, and I, I want to be sick. Uh, uh, Ruth Heflin told um, Benny Hinn that in one of his services, Jesus was going to manifest in person in one of, his, one of his crusades. Do you know how many people believe that? How many Christians believe that? Think about that. Everybody's all excited. <gasps> Oh, I want to be at one of his crusades. It's a marketing concept to get people to want to be there. Because if, if he's coming to Boston, maybe that's the place that Jesus is going to appear. I'm going to go to Boston. Oh, maybe it's in New York. I'm going to go to New York. It's PR. Because Jesus is not coming. And I'll tell you, he won't manifest himself on that stage. Because my Bible tells me in Acts, when they saw Jesus go up, they look into heaven. The two angels said to him, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus will come in the same manner as you've seen him go. So I don't care about all this extra stuff that people say. Oh, uh, this woman, because supposedly was a woman of God or whatever. I don't care what they say. All I know is, what does the Bible say? And I'm telling you, the attack on this word is getting more ferocious and more, more, more fierce than in any other time in history. They're breaking down, the devil's trying to break down the church to believe some of these things and the culture of things and change, letting the culture change the word of God, even to the point where, I think it was Zondervan, if I'm not mistaken, it might, I might be mistaken on the, on the publisher, but I think it was Zondervan, was pushing for an NIV, gender-neutral Bible. And it got shot down. Why? Because if you change the gender, you change the gender, then yeah, a woman could be a pastor. A woman could be the head of the man. Why isn't it miss, Mrs. and Mr. when you get married? That's bigotry. That's that's a that's that's a, thinking men are better than women. Why do I have to take his name? Why can't he take my name? Why isn't it Mrs. Vicky? What was your maiden name? Machado. Why couldn't it be Mrs. Vicky Machado and Mr. Nelson Machado? And it could be me and my shadow. <laughs> right? Why, why, why? Why can't it be that way? Why can't it be Mrs. and Mr. instead of Mr. and Mrs.? Because God has divine order. 
Do you hear me? God has divine order. He does things decently. Doesn't the Bible say that? He does decently and in order. So be aware of what's going on. Don't fall for every trick of the devil. Practice. Get some commentaries. Uh, get some, uh, like the uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the Vines. Get, uh, get a good Bible dictionary. Get some uh, linguistic help for the Greeks and stuff like that. You can get like a lexicon uh, interlinear or something like that to follow along with Scripture. Go back and look at some of the words and find out. One of the great tools that you can use on the Bible is, um, oh, what's the name of it? Uh, Darren, what's the one I gave you? Blue Letter Bible? Blue Letter Bible. Go to Blue Letter Bible on, and download, uh, get, the, get the, um, the website for that. That's got tons of commentaries, helps, all kinds of um, uh, helps that will help you to understand. And if you don't know something, ask someone. Ask somebody because, believe me, I'm telling you, I've, I've had people, and I, I've said this before, I had a person come to me, pastor, I had someone come to me, and tell me, another pastor was telling me, he says, I can't believe this lady. I said, what's the matter? He said, this lady came to him and told him that God told her to divorce her husband and marry this other man. And he said to her, well, wow, that's amazing. Do you have any scriptural backing for it? She goes, yeah, that scripture in the Bible says he takes away the first to establish the second. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not. When it had to do with two covenants, it had nothing to do with marriage. But again, if you read in, it's called eisegesis. You read into the scripture and make it mean what it doesn't say. Or you exegesis, you take the meaning out of the scripture from its context, like what does they mean? Scripture. You interpret it by context. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you. God, I ask you to be with us today, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise for all that you're doing in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, help us to know the truth. You said buy it and don't sell it. Help us not sell out, Lord. The ways of the world and the way of a lot of the so-called churches today are coming up and saying this and saying that and telling stories and their, their motivational speakers more than they are, interpreters of your word. I, that's why I thank you, God, for well, Pastor Dennis, who's a man who preaches your word, interprets your word, and speaks your word. He's not a motivational speaker. I thank you for that, Lord. And, and when he was here preaching in our church, Lord, you fed us your word. And I pray that you always keep him on that track, Lord, and always keep that burning in his heart, Lord. And it's good to see a, I say a young person, but he's 40, he's in his 40s. But, Lord, keep him on the right path, Father. Strengthen and encourage him, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the next time we get to hear him preach again. Father, I pray you bless his wife, Megan. Father, as she's going through her pregnancy, Lord, help her. Lord, just touch her right now, Father. God, and give her strength in her body and, and, and give her uh, an equal, uh, give her a steady uh, demeanor, Lord, where she doesn't get sick and, and has to go up and stuff like that. Father, we just pray that you just touch her, Lord, in Jesus' name. And now, Father, as we go our separate ways, be with us. Lord, strengthen us, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that uh, this other hurricane, Maria, will not come up the East Coast, will go out to sea. Father, and you would, you would begin to speak to your people, Lord, throughout the nations, throughout the world, that you're coming soon. Lord, there was a pastor in, in, in Puerto Rico, and he said, if Puerto Rico doesn't repent, God's going to send strong winds and destroy us. And that was like, I don't know how many six months, a year ago, or whatever it was, two years ago. And Lord, look, it's coming to pass. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would, you would have mercy, that, Lord, through these devastations, Lord, somehow the gospel will be preached. People will be saved. Lord, now as we go our separate ways, give us traveling mercies, be with us, strengthen us, and encourage us. Till we gather again together again on Sunday, Lord, I thank you and praise you for all those that came out. Jesus' name.